you found out very quickly when the coronavirus hit what people thought was necessary and unnecessary. You know, like, here's an example. Um, first person sneezed in China, women's AFL cancelled immediately. <laughs> they were halfway through a season and people said, can we look at maybe continuing the season? Nope, it's done. <laughs> You've had a good run, ladies. It's quite over. You're a liability. <laughs> Men's, the gentleman's game of AFL, ripping through Victoria, 500 cases a day. We will play on! I will buy an island if I have to. Anyone who goes and hangs out with their heavily pregnant wife is a dog. Let the dead bury the dead. Footy never dies. It was an impression of Gil McLaughlin. Um, and the culture had sped up so quickly. The Great Awakening, I heard someone refer to it as, where people have become much more socially progressive without having read anything. And um, that's weird. It's weird to see people go, systematic racism is rampant through our society. And you get to go, well, do you mean that in sort of a, a Gramscian march through the institutions sense or Foucaultian cultural hegemony sort of? No, defund the police. It's great in cities where there's stuff to do, things to tear down. There's, you know, if you're in the deep American South, you can go, there's George Whitey Whiterson, the biggest slave owner in Atlanta and a, just a massive raper of horses, all round bad guy. We're tearing that statue down. And then they tear it down, they all feel good. And I feel very bad for people in cities and towns who just don't have that many statues to tear down. Like in South Australia, people were saying, let's tear down William Light, who is half Malaysian. <laughs> read that book first, maybe. Or so he, was a, he, was, he didn't even found it. He was like, maybe we could use a grid. No! <laughs> no, only non eucidian geography will be used to create a plan. My favourite was Dunedin, where my wife is from in New Zealand. Is that person okay? <laughs> you, you're all right. You're, he's fine. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Jeez. What's strange is that he looks a lot like me. And I, as I looked out into the man who had fallen over and he had similar glasses, similar, yeah, similar beard, similar colouring, similar heft. <laughs> there but for the grace of God go I. Anyway... <laughs> He was so moved by the plight of statues coming down that he hurled himself from his chair. Hey, sorry? Maybe he was a side violin. No, I, I can't agree more. Anyway, the important... We'll get back to it. My wife is from Dunedin, and they don't have many good statues to tear down. Um, yeah, I know. The one statue they have, and they thought about tearing down, was a statue of the poet Robbie Burns. <laughs> the Scottish poet Robbie Burns. <laughs> what are the accused crimes of Robbie Burns, who died just before the 19th century began? I'll tell you. He, he had sex with many women, and feminists who have read his letters suspect that not all of those encounters were consensual. I mean, personally, I think if... If a man in the 1700s had any sexual encounters that were consensual, he was probably ahead of his time. <laughs> but, uh, and then you read the letters that they're saying that he was a sex pest. Weinsteinian, one feminist said his activities were. And one of the things that he said is, I, I wrote it down, but I've left my phone backstage, so it doesn't matter. He said something like, in a letter to his friend, he was like, oh, it was a battle to get her into the sack but I fucked her till she rejoiced. <laughs> and feminists have gone, well, this is clearly a man who's committed a sexual crime. I don't know, it sounds like he just made a lady come. <laughs> it sounds like he's a poet and he found a nice way of, I fucked her till she rejoiced. That just sounds like he's a gentleman, frankly. I mean, he cares about her pleasure. <laughs> so that was one of the things he did to be torn down. And the other thing he did to be torn down was that he thought about working in the slave trade, but then some other stuff came up, so he didn't. <laughs> That's the bar. 
couple of days, he was going, will I go to the Caribbean islands and work as an overseer? No, I've got a book to work on. <laughs> if that's the bar for tearing down statues, we, a daydream, a speculative half plan. Every statue of me is going to have to be taken down because of my many fantasies of machete crime. <laughs> um, it's... You know, ten years and I still don't understand the rules to Millionaire Hot Seat. I understood who wants to be a millionaire. Sit down, answer your questions, get one wrong, go home. What the fuck is going on on Millionaire Hot Seat? There's six of them. There's a timer. They don't, they can pass and then they come back, but sometimes they don't. And then at the end, Eddie Maguire gives one of them a seemingly random amount of money. I'm trying to learn how to forgive people. I'm not, because I've, I've welcomed Christ into my heart and uh, you have to forgive people or else God will never forgive you and you'll burn forever in the fiery pits of hell. Yeah, he's very specific on that point. It's, um, yeah, but I'm trying to forgive and I'm not very good at it because I'm, I'm driven by hate. But I figured out a secret, a secret trick to forgive. If you can use it if you like. I think it's pretty good. I just, when someone wrongs me, I pretend that they have a disability and that it would be wrong to hold that disability against them. You know, it can't be any disability. It can't be someone cuts me off in traffic and I go, he's an amputee! Because <laughs> I've got a fear of them. But um, it has to be a specific, specific, you know, like, so if I argue with a friend about politics, and I think he's absolutely wrong, but I have to see him again, I'll just go, oh, he's got a very specific kind of autism that doesn't allow him to see that he's a fuckhead. <laughs> and it would be wrong to hold a man's autism against him. It's a neurodiverse landscape. God bless him. <laughs> I love him very much. Do you ever... Do you ever... Do you ever find yourself going, this is not my beautiful house? <laughs> and do you ever find yourself saying, this is not my beautiful wife? And you ask yourself, how did I get here? And then you go, oh yeah, I broke into that guy's house and I fucked his wife. <laughs> I beat my debt. I conquered debt. I was in a lot of debt. I was in like $40,000 of debt. And I beat it. And I'm now in no debt. And I can tell you how to do it. The tricky way to get out of debt is you have to have nothing. This is a great, this is a trick because people call you. This doesn't work if you're in debt to bad people, I must say. They'll, they'll just kill your child. But if you're in debt to a company in Perth with strict legal regulations about how they can get that money back, have nothing. Have nothing. They can't do anything. If I had anything, I would have been boned. If I had a disability pension, if I had a... And I think they would call me and they'd go, you, you owe us $40,000. It's a lot of money. And you're going to need to find a way to pay us back. I can't. <laughs> well, what about your Centrelink money? I don't have any. I live with my mum. <laughs> and I'm too sad to apply for the dog. Well, listen, you know, and then they, they start selling you up. They try and convince you that you need it. They go, listen, you could turn your life around if you get involved with the payment plan with us, you know, because if you don't, it's going to hurt your credit score and you won't be able to get a mortgage for the next seven years. Oh, oh no. <laughs> That's my plan's absolutely ruined. If you said I wasn't allowed to ride the bus for the next seven years, that's a threat. <laughs> My dreams of home ownership, gone. If you have nothing, then they just come down. They go, I have nothing. Well, would you pay us $20,000? I could probably find $2,000. <laughs> well, where are you finding the $2,000 from? Oh, that's a speculation. I have nothing. Maybe if I only needed $2,000, people would feel sorry for me. 
Well, we're going to call everybody you know. We're going to call your employer and shame you. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that would be so bad if I had one. <laughs> and then they start calling my friends. They called Amos, they called Craig, who books this gig. I hope they asked him to start paying me more money for these shows. But uh, I found my neighbour's phone number. But you have to have nothing for this to work. That includes shame and dignity. You have to be absolutely impenetrable to all the normal human feelings. And so now I have no debt and a reasonable credit score. Yep. But I'm paying rent on a house that I can't be at and they can't find a new tenant, so there's a recipe for more debt. <laughs> That's how it starts. You've been very kind to me. I've, gee, I, I wanted to talk briefly about um, transgender men, but... Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, um, I've got a problem with them, and um, <laughs> this is people born with uh, without penises who want to present as men. And my issue, with, my only issue with it, really, is that they cut off their breasts. <laughs> I mean, what are they saying about men that we can't? I mean, as a man with titties and a big fat dick. Are they saying I'm less of a man because of my succulent, milky bosoms? Are they saying that a man can't have soft, pillowy teats? That's perfectly fine. That's being a man. And they go, but I want to go to the beach and take my shirt off. Get in line! <laughs> Try wearing a rash vest indoors for years! James, there's no UV in here. No, it's 